Well, it's been a couple of days since Picard premiered. Dr. Trek himself, Larry Nemechek, is standing by over to my left. We're going to have a chat about this brand new series. Let's get into it. Across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube, this is the eighth season of A Trek Zone Conversation with Matt Miller. Seasons. Welcome to it. It feels and like it's 47. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, Larry Nemechek, back to Trek Zone. A new feel, a new vibe as we record these days. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to spoil your opening. But yes, it's funny. I mean, it's like people are excited for Picard. They're excited for, I think, what people are finally starting to get it, I think, even in the bigger picture. Mm. You know what I mean? Now, Star Trek Picard, we uh, were lucky enough uh, to see it ahead of its broadcast on Thursday in the US, Friday for the rest of the world. Uh, how cool has this anticipation been, this this hype for this new show? Well, the it's funny because I was just having a conversation about a month ago online with some another person in Trek Media who was just saying, I don't think they've been promoting this very hard. I think we see it, but I don't think – and I think the last month has certainly – blown that out of the water because they've been all over the world you know that i mean to just today as we recorded this they had the pr little get of uh of patrick stewart sir patrick asking Whoopi goldberg to be in season two that was while they were while he was doing his bit on the view here in the states so um and that's like melting down the internet just in this in an echo of what happened how all this kicked off you know publicly when when the, the internet melted down when Patrick and, and Alex uh, announced it at Star Trek Las Vegas in 2018. So, yeah, and I think it's almost – well, we can talk about this, but I, I think uh, they've done a great job. I think everybody's excited. You see YouTubers doing – you know, people are fans, whatever it is, their Twitter, their, their YouTube videos, just having local meetups. I'm helping with a local meetup here, a watch party here in um, – in uh, Los Angeles and trying to encourage people to get word out if they're having a local one too. So yeah, it's just, it's just an excitement. And, and there's been enough real world spoilering and promoting and the vibe that came out of all three of those premieres, you know, in LA and then in London and then in Berlin uh, and all the Q and a, I th it's just been a, it's been a wonderful PR job. And of course a PR job masterfully done falls apart the minute sometimes the product is actually seen and I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think it's all big one, one big ramp up and people are, I think most fans are going to be, uh, the vast majority of fans are going to be not only thrilled, but reassured that a Star Trek show can launch well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the big difference too is that being a, a streaming launch and we were sort of there with Discovery, but, but even more so now with Picard, I, I think that being a streaming launch it's not incumbent and required of people to sit down at, uh, you know, eight, nine central uh, or nine, eight central <laughs> to catch the broadcast. It's as soon as you're ready to watch it, it's going to be there. It's going to be out on the 23rd. So yeah, I, I think you're right with the, with the press, it's sort of been building the momentum uh, and sort of keeping it in that news cycle, just as it's about to uh, drop for everyone everywhere. Yeah, well, I've been laughing that this is definitely like the second kid in the family of this family, yeah. because it's like you know, and and yes, Discovery had a rough birth. <laughs> you know, like the father walked out of the delivery room. That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the father walked out in the prenatal training <laughs> before the delivery room. Yes. You know, and like all those tortured metaphors, and and even the premieres, people were like, hmm, eh. And I mean, they had so much to get through, aside from even the content of the show. For a lot of the world, this whole, what is this streaming thing? And I, God didn't mean for Star Trek to cost money. You know, I mean, there was all of this wave to get through and people now get it. And people are paying to watch The Mandalorian on Disney Plus now. So, you know, I think we're through that wave. And then this, this show just had a much softer birth. You know, uh, it just been, totally benefited from the whale oil machine actually being a machine that was well oiled yeah. by now. And I would just say this out of selfishness, they're shooting this one in California yes. where God intended Star Trek to be made. <laughs> Vasquez <laughs> rocks even makes an appearance. And I think for the first yeah. time it's actually yes. itself. Oh, in are we going to say that? Okay. <laughs> I don't think I that's think giving that too much hilarious. away. Well, I love that. And I don't know. They probably have a technical term in the, in the trade, in the industry. 
I just call them the X files, you know, the chrono line, the, 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 the chrono key ID line, the lower thirds lines, you know, for time, time and place. Cause there are, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of flashbacks going on mm. and, uh, and they're, they're trying to keep you straight on where everything is. So yes, that one moment I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's like, let's not hide it guys. Yeah. Let's just go with it. <laughs> so, but, but then I'm thinking what, so it's not a public park anymore. It's wait. Okay. We're in the 24th century. Do they have private ownership of land <laughs> then it was like oh no i've got a whole new canon thing here to deal with but it was interesting <laughs> but is she squatting on that parkland and no one's noticing you that, know what's happening very yeah well they, these are the questions that we want answers to <laughs> yes of course was she now what was she kicked out well i sh- are we getting ahead of our spoilers here what was the nature of her the end of her service with starfleet and does that entitled her to squat on a public park land <laughs> is, is i don't it, know is it part of the uh, dis- is, is it part of the retirement from starfleet perhaps <laughs> yeah you had to pick somewhere in the federation she you know <laughs> i think premium Vas- sites on earth were already far gone but no apparently not well it's interesting too because vasquez rocks as a location isn't necessarily near anything Starfleet related. Obviously, Starfleet headquarters is in San Francisco. Uh, Federation president's office is in Paris. So oh, it probably I, is. It might be Los Angeles, but it's it's well out of the way. <laughs> I've said this for years, for, ever since it dawned on me when I was first doing star charting, like in the 90s, it's like, or even the 80s maybe, it's like, do the Andorians and Tellarites and Vulcans and everybody else in the Federation, do they ever get a little weary of the of the Earth-centric nature of everything? Like, you know, the, all the capitals are on Earth. President's office on Earth. Federation councils on Earth. I would be shocked that the Federation Supreme Court wasn't on Earth. I mean, you know, it's like, do they ever get a little – Starfleet Academy main campus is on Earth. Starfleet yes. Command headquarters are on Earth. What happens I if Earth gets blown little, up by the Zindi again? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what if I get hit by a bus? Who's going to do all this next? I mean, you know, it's like you should diversify, guys. I would I would be surprised. I'm kind of shocked that we haven't seen somebody, you know, but that's a, hopefully now that we're in the stream era, we can finally have that visit to Teller Prime. Yes. You know, and learn more about Andor and and Andoria and everything and you know, even Vulcan. We've barely we barely seen. So the and all the other lovely, you know, Beta Z, we've never been to Beta Z. And, yeah. And Malaris and, but, you know, go down the list. All your B planets. Well, there's there's seven uh, there's seven seasons of Star Trek Picard to come. So uh, I'm sure somewhere in there they're going to come up with something. Oh, seven? Oh. Seven? Do you? Well, that's that's what I'm saying. They've renewed it for oh, the okay. second before the first is even released. So No, no. I mean, well, Patrick, at least early on, said something like, we've got three seasons of material at least. Yeah, that's so right. I, you know, and it's streaming. So. We'll see. Anything's possible. Yeah, Discovery, I think, looks like they're trying to aim for – I think Discovery's going to say, well, if we have a fourth season, it's really our third because the first doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so The first was just the trial run. Measure it in your years. Okay. <laughs> I, I love that line. It comes in so handy. It does. The other thing that we haven't seen a lot of uh, in Star Trek is civilian life uh, down on, yes. on planet Earth. Uh, obviously, it sort of started with the, the Kelvin universe where we started to get, uh, you know, pop songs in in the show instead of orchestral yeah. mixes and, and that sort of stuff and the jury's out on that um so we well, can of- i just say i'd like i don't mind pop songs versus orchestral and like classical music but can we somebody like invent what it sounds like in the 21st century or the yeah. 23rd or the 22nd does everything have to be within this narrow time window between the 1700s and the 1900s or the you know I'm well, just, I'm just saying. I'm like just saying. we used to do, Larry, with 90s Trek and time traveling, we always went back to the present day. So yeah. maybe this is the, you know, this is the Amazing similarity. Amazing how that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the civilian life, we, you know, we're seeing Boston for the first time in, in that first mm-hmm. episode where, where Daja's apartment uh, and she's attacked by these mysterious people. Uh, no spoilers uh, for, for the fine folks that haven't seen it yet. Maybe a little bit of spoilers, but uh, nothing too devastating, I, I think, is the key here as we move forward in our chat. We've, we've seen her cir- seek out Picard for help. Yeah. So yes, the the need for her help starts in Boston, which is otherwise not a nothing to do with the plot. I just I I've been meaning to go and see which of the writers was from Boston that wanted to get their hometown. Yes. You know. And immortalized. You know, it, it's interesting to see uh, it's something that I said. We we haven't seen the civilian life. We haven't quite seen taxis, uh, shuttle shuttle taxis 
which I mm-hmm. guess are just called shuttles in the in the future. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we saw a school bus taxi shuttle thing in Children of Mars in the short track, which which sent a, a fraction of Twitter into meltdown. Like, they have school buses. Yes. I just want to say, well, you know, it's like, to me, it's like when we see public transporters. Oops, am I spoiling too much? I don't think Which so. got a wave of, uh, I think it's been out because there was a wave of public discussion somewhere online about how did that work and how, how does that happen and why are they, who's running the transporter? I'm like, oh my God, guys, it's. We finally see it. It's on a mass scale. Yeah. Here's how it looks. You know, it has to be easy and convenient. And you know, also, to you, too, so. the, the other thing, because that was in the trailer, and what, what I think is interesting about that is – Thank you. O- okay. Obviously, it, um, it's, it is a mass transit system, and there doesn't seem to be a transporter chief and a controller and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I think what people will find in the show is that it's actually at Starfleet headquarters. So right. perhaps – I would assume that everyone operating those or, or using those transporters are Starfleet uh, officers, crew, or you know whatever they might be. Uh, they would all have com badges, or they would have some sort of For thing Starfleet where they would use. Yeah, right. something. That some may not st- be a. Yeah, it might not be as mass, mass, mass in use as we think about. Although you know, in DS Nine, they would talk about uh, being on Earth and and um, and maybe that was cadet privileges, but uh, Nog. That's and, right, and maybe Jake like beaming back to New Orleans for dinner at the Cisco's at the Cisco's dad's place. Well, Ben Cisco actually did say in that episode that uh, he used a month's or a year's worth of transporter rations in one month by beaming home every night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's possible. I mean, we thought we, we thought of it in such a linear term of going to a transporter room and, and beaming over, but perhaps not. Well, I mean, you know, we had limits, and we've evolved that along. I mean, we've had everything from from monetary rates for long distance phone calling versus your free local, I'm air quoting all through this, you know, which we've outgrown now over 20 years as the technology and the different grids evolved, but still there are limitations on, you know, a a cell network can melt down in a time of crisis Mm -hmm. or, you know, you can overload a grid so that there's, if there's limits in place. How do we get off talking about I don't know. (laughs) We have a whole sprawling epic and we're down in the minutia of this. But it's the kind of thing, this is what happens when you have a fresh show going. And it's also what happens when you have a fresh going, a fresh series going. As much as I love I, I hate calling them prequels. To me, it's just fleshing out different points in the in the timeline, mm. in the in the number line of Star Trek. And I think it all should be. I'm not anti or pro prequel or postquel or whatever, <laughs> but whatever you want to call it. But this is the first time we've had a show move into the future. So rather than people haggling about canon, they're all now we're back into concept conversations. You know, like what will things look like twenty mm. years from the last time we saw them? Much less how is our own real science and tech and culture catching up to what we saw on TV at different times. And now they have to push it ahead into something that feels even more in the future. Yeah. We had to get over it. You had to have some separation in real life for us to be able to bring things to the table besides just tech your ways of production, which is a big thing too, but to have some, some concepts of what to do for the basic life of them mm -hmm. based on what, where we've come since the eighties and nineties. And, and, and you get a lot, you get a good dose of that, but you also get that slow motion life he has out in, yeah, the estate in Labar, which was also shot in uh, Santa Santa yes. Santa Mar- I'm losing my oh, yeah. Santas. Yes. <laughs> I think Santa Maria. Yeah, um, they were outed. The poor owner had to like stay mum three or four months ago. He's yes. like, I kept, you know, I say nothing, nothing. But, the best, uh, yeah. The best part was when that was when that <laughs> filming location was leaked uh, with Project Royal Flush uh, as the working title or as the the <laughs> covert title. The brilliant thing was that uh, when we found that out just after the Vegas convention, um, Keely and I were off to Universal uh, and after Disneyland, and and we took the the trolley tour, and lo and behold, uh, you know, we'd heard the rumors, or Jerry Ryan had actually let slip at in Vegas that they were filming at Universal. Uh, under Project Royal Flush, as we found out. And as we took that trolley tour, lo and behold, there they were filming. So we here at Trekzone actually got to see, didn't see too much. <laughs> yes. we, we saw some port loos and, uh, <laughs> and some trailers. You but... were, yes, you blogged about that and posted about that. And it was, it was what, was it the stairs or was that all from, I'm trying to remember if that, some of that was from, all of it was from the Anaheim Convention. The, you know, the face of famously also was out. Yeah. The uh, Anaheim Convention Center where WonderCon, for one thing for a lot of fans. That's right. Yeah. Year, is that green tinted glass, the new set there of uh, for Star Trek for uh, 
uh, Starfleet Command. Yep. And they even film inside the foyer, you know, the big lobby area that's common to a lot of convention centers. So that whole smirking at the cadet that doesn't know him by sight scene, that's all you know, out there too. But what was the scene that was shot where at Universal? Well, that is the question, Larry, because I don't think I saw that uh, in the first three episodes oh. that we saw. Well, so then there we go. That's All to right. come. But I mean, there it was go. a desolate sort of uh, setup. It was in the it was in their back lot, um, quite quite okay. a ways into their back lot. So quite uh, scrubby. <clears throat> um, there was a giant blue screen as well. So obviously, they're going to be keying in a different sky. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, it's <laughs> it's not Rafi's place at Vasquez Rocks because they literally went to Vasquez Rocks, right. and that was another one that we Wait, we actually managed. Which to is a my location story because I had two. I had. Uh, two ladies doing a Trekland Treks, one of our day tours we do for film sites. And we were out at Vasquez Rocks and I, you always take a chance because there might actually be real filming going on. And we, we pulled up over the top of the hill into the bottom land there between the, by the tilted rocks, between the Gorn rocks and the Capellan rocks is what I like to call them. You got the, the not, not Cestus. People think it's Cestus three. No, Cestus three was where the battle started. Then where they had the fight was an unnamed planet. So the Gorn planet That's was on right. one side yep. and Capella four was on the other but there was a big look like a big trailer no camera crew no fight but it looked like the remnant either it was about to happen like a day later or they had wrapped and this was the last remnant either otherwise there was a big trailer with a big tarp white tarp colored thing that looked about like a, a trailer home you know an rv uh, uh, uh one of the big fancy rvs and it was up on this trailer and i was like oh god either they're about to start or they've finished and they were like, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I said, so you guys were what, doing a commercial? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're doing a commercial. <laughs> I found out about a month later, somebody saw our post and said, Larry, they were filming Picard. Up there. <laughs> so, yes. Well, the Trek Zone reader actually uh, caught that filming. And we had uh, we updated the the blog with, mm -hmm. with those photos as well. So really cool to... Uh, I just love that. You know, you, you're out there, they're, they're filming in the real world. They're not just confined to the Paramount lot uh, like they were in the 90s. There's a little bit more of a budget uh, to make a things. Budget. Yeah. And probably, yeah. <clears throat> probably the budget from necessity of needing to be big, uh, big action to draw in the crowds. Well, and it wasn't even a big, I mean, there were some action set. We saw, you know, fight choreography, which you expect. But I think. There was a lot, you know, some of the criticism about Discovery was how how action heavy it was and space battle heavy. And at least in the first three. Now, they're are we spoiling this? They're they're just getting into what might be the meat of the story after th there's plenty of story, and you're getting a lot of backstory and you're meeting a lot of characters. And there's a lot of action set pieces in the first three hours, much less the first hour. Mm. But you can there's a lot of story still to come and a lot of locales still to get to after even three hours. But in that time, the people who complained about Discovery, you know, being so slam bam, thank you, ma'am, slick effects, slick, big, incre incredible, crazy Jason Bourne type, you know, extended, or dare I say, Star Trek into darkness. Oh, we're fighting for 20 minutes on a speeding shuttle. <laughs> kind of crazy. That is not what at least the first three hours of Picard are about. And I think those people are going to be relieved because for one thing, it's Patrick Stewart. At his mm. age, but it's also Patrick Stewart and his mentality and his character, his care for this character, especially after it got reinvigorated by what he got from fan. It was a, it was a goose, a chicken and the egg situation between the new team pitching him to come back and what the story would be and the reaction he got right up until the moment. And then immediately after, mm. I think it's all gel that he did the right thing. But with him in the dry, as long as he was in that writer's room and in that think tank. I, I was pretty secure about it. And then the fact that Kirsten Beyer was in there and what we've all found out about Michael Chabon, that triumvirate there, that trio alone was making me feel real good. And nothing I've seen coming out in the promos, all the interviews, you know, their choices on how to bring old, you know, having all these new characters, but also bringing back some faces mm. and, and where the future is, that's still wide open to do more, as we saw today with the guy and Whoopi announcement. Yeah. So it's like, that would be stupid not to, but there's a good way and a bad way to do that. And, you know, it could wind up being, oh, that was just in there for fanboy service, fan service. Mm. But that's not what any of this looks like. It's all very smartly done. And I totally trust Kirsten. And, you know, Shaben's written some pieces that show where he comes from, that he doesn't see canon as an, uh, a rock around his neck. He sees it as all those things that have not yet been explored. 
which I'm like, yes, that's what I've been saying for 20 years. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, that's why. And everything I saw, to put it, put a point on it here, everything I saw in the premiere just – I said – I told someone it felt like, like you got a new pair of slippers that felt like they'd been broken in for 20 years already, but they look shiny new. Yeah. <laughs> I've, you know, I felt at home with with Picard. Yes. I know it was really interesting actually to to watch that dynamic. And I was talking to a Star Wars uh, cameraman friend of mine yesterday, uh, talking mm. about it. He hasn't seen it yet, but he was sort of picking my brain uh, as best as I could. Uh, obviously, we're recording before the embargoes are lifted, so I can't say too much. Uh, you know, <laughs> in the real world, while we're recording for Sunday, obviously we can talk all about it, but. Uh, uh, he actually helped me to see that I, I think this is Star Trek's Mandalorian. It's about one central character in a slowly developing, a simmering pot of a mm. plot. Uh, we're not going big action with an ensemble cast of eight or nine. There's not a new hero ship to talk about. Uh, it's just Picard picking up a few people along the way and working out exactly what Daj's story is. And I truly think that uh, obviously there's no cute baby Yoda involved in this, but uh, the, I, I reckon number one, the pit bull could uh, maybe take that mantle. It'll go there. Well, uh, what you know, a few months into after the big meltdown announcement at Vegas in 2018, as as the as the bones of this, like, well, I could see all kinds of things happening here, but knowing, well, knowing Patrick, but not let me like knowing like we have dinner every week, but I mean, knowing what he stands for and where his career has been and the fact that he came up as a trained Shakespearean actor, a stage actor, and everything he brought to Star Trek. And you watched Farpoint today, and you if you'd seen it in 87, it's the same thing if you're newly watching it today. You can, aside from you know maybe the datedness of the production, but as far as the story and the characters, you know that's a pilot. And I remember in 87 going, Okay, there's a lot of promise here. There's all these new characters, all these new concepts, and the most solid one of all of it was Patrick Stewart and Captain Picard. It's like you can tell mm. who had been trained as a Shakespearean actor because he took what he had and he made something of it. And you know they've got years to spin out all the other characters, and that's all going to happen in the future. And you wouldn't get everything about everybody in mm. the first two hours, obviously. But it was just to me how far ahead he was of all the other actors and characters as far as – having a sense of who he was and what he was and feeling grounded, you know? Mm. And so, you know, fast forward, it's the same way here, but he's always had that, um, he's always had that groundedness. I don't even say gravitas, gravitas, but I mean that groundedness to take what's on the written page and what's, you know, and here's a case where he's in the think tank, he's in the writer's room, he's helping to, he's got executive producer status, so he's getting to do that. Mm. So you expect that and you expect him to inject the show with that and if it wasn't if that wasn't part of his deal if he wasn't going to have that kind of input he wouldn't have been you know this would have been a moot point yep yeah exactly you know right. so so hopefully everything gelled and then of course wheels can come off of the best wagons but that apparently did not happen here i'm sure they had a couple of people come and go some of the names in the room have come and gone and they've already lost michael shaban to go develop his own things and now terry Metalis, who was uh Brad and Braga's assistant for years. I remember him sitting out in front, you know, putting up with his boss for years. But he's gone on to a career. He did 12 Monkeys, and now he's been announced as the showrunner for season two. And oh, I'm, ex I'm excited for him. Yeah. And yes, I love how they say he was part of the production team. It was like he was getting Brandon's laundry for, you know, <laughs> he was as well. But then I say that by the time of Enterprise, he was working on his writing career and he sold and pitched and has two, two script credits, which is what a lot of people go to. It's like my mental image is, is Terry sitting out at the front desk in the outer office of Brandon's office. But, you know, good on him. And I think and people 12 Monkeys got a lot of he's worked on something else since then it escapes me. But 12 Monkeys it was his baby. Yeah, uh, he created show. it as well as ran it. Yeah, and and that got a lot of acclaim and and a lot of fan uh, love. So I'm, you know, he's got Star Trek DNA, and he's shown the chops to run, and he's got this support team up and running already. Mm. So I'm excited, you know. And now Whoopi, yes, um, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. All right, Larry, well, uh, it's going to be tough, but let's boil it down. The first three episodes okay. with a A, B, C, D, or F grade. Where do you think the series is? Oh, is oh, because that's good. Because the first three uh, blur together in my brain. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to say an A. 
And depending on who you are, you might think A minus or A plus. But I don't know. I don't know who could not just come out of there smiling. You yes. might have a f- couple of mm's, but it's like it's no big deal. I'm, I'm going to say A. I think the big thing as well, uh, and, I, and I don't think this is a spoiler point because it's at the start of episode one, but Picard is now drinking Earl Grey tea decaf with milk <laughs> so you know but the biggest thing is we're not retconning anything here we're in the future they've ruined the franchise <laughs> yeah. by that one decision but perhaps picard got that medical advice that he needs to just stop drinking so much yeah. caffeine let's see about <laughs> episode five or six or seven here's the other thing though i've still yet to see title names Everything is still 101, 102, 103, 104, you know? Ah, yes. Well, it is. Had they announced them just today because they weren't out this? Uh, and they're I... not in. It's the modern way. The heaven forbid we put the title on the actual film of the episode. Yeah. Well, we. I'm just going to quickly dive into the emails here because CBS, with the screeners they, that they sent me, uh, they did include the episode names. I know episode oh. one is Remembrance. Episode Alrighty two then. is Maps and Legends. And episode Thank three. You. Can you tell I'm typing this as you say this? <laughs> and episode three is The End is the Beginning. Working work here, right? In As we record. Yes. Well, uh, obviously episode two and three are to come. Obviously only episode one has been released. Yes, um, every week. And Amazon did give me those details to hold until the embargo, but it's Sunday now, so... Uh, it's Sunday. Can, well, here's the thing. <laughs> People get excited about this, and then it's like, it's streaming. Ten episodes. Bang. This will be done by uh, end of March. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we've got Discovery. Like, Lower Decks. Discovery to be, yes, Lower Decks, apparently. It's going to be very exciting. All right, Larry. Yeah. Well, that is exactly. about where we're at uh, to talk non-spoilers on the three episodes that we've seen. The hardest thing for mm-hmm. us, I think, is that we have to wait until the rest of the world catches up. We have to wait the rest of the world catches up. And I'm already, I'm ready for episode four. I have to slog through three weeks of already, but exactly. it'll be reinforcing. It'll be, you know, it's only, only been one take so far. I think the best part for us though, is that we can sit back and listen, uh, read the tweets and read the comments and go, yeah, see, told you, mm-hmm. told you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All those, all those things. Yep. And, and what else has happened between now and to real briefly, what else has happened difference between now and discovery is we are much smarter about our social media and our communication channels. Yeah. And people have learned to call out the bots, not legitimate criticism. I will always, cause I'll, I want to make that myself, yep. but just the pure bots and trolls and the rumor mongering and people just in it for the money or the clicks or whatever. I mean, there's been a lot of call out already. Um, so it, it's. I'm glad to see the premieres coming because people can finally see that. I don't understand how you get there. They, CBS and Prime <laughs> has has released so much promo material that I don't know how you come away seeing that and think somehow you're being tricked. You know, like oh, these are the these are the ten highlights of the whole damn ten hours. Yeah. You know, and the rest is just junk. Yeah. And it has does not have the. It, Trust me on this. Trust, trust you. <laughs> trust trust, trust all of us that have actually seen it and said that it is really good. Uh, but yes. I think the other thing too is make up your own mind. True. Don't True. just totally dismiss it because you're listening to those naysayers uh, and, and yes. don't just fall in love with it because of us that are saying it's it's brilliant. You know, I totally reserve the right to critique. Absolutely. And I've got a couple of those bro- or things that I go, okay, we'll have to retcon that. But then again, we've only seen three of the 10 hours. I also tweeted, I'm waiting to see this. I think I heard end of second episode, beginning of third, a, a, a minor, at the very least, it's a minor retcon for an old chunk of Trek canon, which may have nothing to do with the plot. There's a <laughs> lot of visual, there's a lot of unstated visual things that fly by and you're going, oh, cool, oh, cool, oh, cool. Had nothing to do with the story so far. They might eventually, but even if they don't have anything to the story, there's a lot of smart visual retconning. There are there mm. are fans and veterans who are working at different levels of the show. Uh, and again, Kirsten Beyer is the one who brought canon touches into her Voyager novels when they of Beyond Voyager. So I'm so thrilled she's there. It definitely shows her touch, and that she's not like low as in Discovery. She's not like number eight on the on the ladder of seven writers. Mm. <laughs> she's in the circle. She's down as a co-creator and a, you know. So that's all, all good news for the greater, the greater good of, of, of the Star Trek universe. 
So um, that's why I'm excited. And I think I saw a little thing that I'm going to be curious to see if it actually plays out in the plot or if it's just one little gimme that's in there so we can go back later and say, see, see that. Okay, that has to do with this. So I'm going to lay that. I'm just going to leave it there. And we'll sometime down the future, we can talk about that later. Absolutely, Larry. Well, it is awesome to talk Picard with you. It's the first time I've been able to talk to someone else uh, about this series that I've seen. I'm very excited to see what everyone uh, is thinking. Uh, and of course, comments down below on YouTube uh, and of course on social media as well. I want to hear your thoughts uh, on Star Trek Picard. You can find Larry at Larry Nemechek on on Twitter, at Larry Nemechek's Trekland on Facebook, Portal 47, The Trek Files, all of those cool things that Larry does. Awesome bloke, knows his Trek. Larry, thanks so much for talking Star Trek Picard today. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Well, next time. <laughs> <laughs>